Well, good morning, Cross Point Church. How many of you are thankful for Jesus this morning? Anybody? <laughs> Amen. Hey, uh, security has let me know that we have an issue here at Cross Point Church, and that is we have run out of seats. And so we want to just ask you, if you will, just sort of squeeze in here this morning and make room. We have some people that are standing in the back, and that's a great problem to have this morning, isn't it? Amen. Amen. So our ushers will be able to now move some people in that... Uh, that are needing some seats, but we have a, a few more still coming in here this morning. We want to, to deal with that as quickly as possible. But I, I tell you, what an incredible time of worship we've had this morning. Amen? Man, what an incredible time of worship, beginning with our, you know, including our children's ministry, our worship ministry. I just want to just thank our worship team here this morning for all they do. Can we just thank them this morning? Man. And I don't know if you realize it or not, but during that last song that we just sang, Miracle Child, there was something that was taking place behind them. It was a, on this back screen back here. There was a, all these different uh, videos that were happening individually as they were all sort of coming together. But each one of these hexagons represents a life changed by the message of Christ in their life here at Cross Point Church over the last year. All these are people who were baptized here this year, and we couldn't even fit them all up on the screen, but this is most everybody that was baptized, and, and it's just a, a beautiful display, a beautiful testimony of how God is working in incredible ways throughout the life of our church. Isn't our God just a, an amazing God and just one who is constantly changing lives? It's just so in, incredible to be able to see all of that taking place. You know, I was uh, just thinking about uh, Easter this year and the, and the fact that, that we celebrate Easter every year. And at Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every year. That's just what we do during Easter. But I, I don't know why this year was different, but it was for me personally. It just seemed different. It just felt different. And uh, I went to Ryan this week, and I was talking to him, and I said, Ryan, I don't know what it is, but I just feel like I have been worshiping Jesus all week. It's just been an incredible time of just spending time with the Lord, and I feel that a lot of you have been experiencing that as well. It's just a different time of the year where we center our hearts and our minds on Jesus Christ. We remember all that He has done. We think about who He is, and we think about the life change that He brought to our life when He saved us. Amen? Amen. And so now we have that just remarkable opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, which is what Easter is all about. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's because of in my prayer time, uh, just thinking about some of the things that Jesus said, maybe that's what it was. Listen to what Jesus said. He said this, he says, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Could we just thank Jesus for that great truth this morning? That our Savior lives. And what a remarkable truth that is to celebrate as we get together. So this morning we are celebrating this fact that He is risen, right? That's what it's all about. I want to encourage you to go ahead and open up your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, that's where we're going to be. We're going to be looking at the first 10 verses of this great chapter. Matthew 28 is, is, is sort of the end of, of Matthew's gospel, but boy, it doesn't stop offering to us some great insight on who Jesus is and what he accomplished. You know, over the, over the past Easter's, I, I kind of look back and I see what it is that I've, I've preached on. I don't want it to be, feel like it's the same sermon. And, and one of the things I've noticed is over the years, what I'll do a lot of times is focus on the historical evidence of the resurrection and there is a lot of evidence of the resurrection one of the things I love that scripture reveals to us is that over 500 people literally witnessed the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ in fact most scholars think that number was closer to 800 people that saw Jesus that talked to Jesus that encountered Jesus after he was crucified on the cross, buried in a tomb, and rose from the grave. And so that in itself would stand up in any courtroom, wouldn't it? 
the fact that there were so many people who saw Jesus. And so a lot of times we focus on that, that evidence that gives credibility to the resurrection. But this morning I want to do things a little bit different. I want to focus on something I think is very challenging to all of us, something that causes us to think and to, to consider as we think about Jesus and all that he is. And what I want to do is I want to, I want to focus this morning on what each and every one of us as individuals truly believe about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And not just what we believe, but, but do we truly believe in the power of the resurrection? Do we believe in the, the significance of the resurrection? Do we believe in the truth of the resurrection? And as we think of all that, do we, do we live out our lives as though we truly do believe what we say we believe about the resurrection? And so this morning, as we prepare to read through our text here this morning, I want to ask you to consider that. And we'll be talking a little bit about that as we dive into the message here this morning. So starting with verse 1, Matthew 28, the scripture says this, now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, and he rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you in Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. And so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. According to Pew Research, these days there are 2.4 billion people on the planet that say they're a Christian. 2.4 billion people who testify that they are Christians, that they believe in Jesus. Now, I know a lot of them are on spring break this week, right? <laughs> so they're, they're probably not all gathered in church this morning, but, but the reality is if there's that many Christians, people who call themselves Christians, gathering in churches all over this world, gathering with their local family, they are probably doing exactly what we're doing today because it is Easter, and that is they are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about that. All of the people who say they believe in Jesus gathered together to celebrate this great truth that Jesus is risen. Amen? Amen. That he is alive, that he is well. And so this is what we do. This is what we do on Easter Sunday. We gather together to celebrate the resurrection. But I've been thinking about that. And I've been wondering about that. About all these Christians who gather to celebrate the resurrection. And one of the things I have been wondering is I've been wondering of the many who gather together today what would they say about how the resurrection affects their lives daily? I want you to think about that. What would they say as they contemplate the power of the resurrection? 
Do these Christians that gather today to celebrate Easter, do they truly believe in the significance of the resurrection and what the resurrection truly means for their life every single day? Do they live their life as though they truly believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power of God that it reveals to the world? That Jesus Christ, though he was crucified on a cross and taken down from that cross as a dead man and put in a borrowed tomb for three days and left for dead, after three days he was raised from the grave. Do they believe that? In other words, how many of us, even here today, really believe in the power of the resurrection? You see, a long time ago, there was this man. He was a man of great power. He had stature. He had education. He was a very influential man. He was a guy that that was known throughout the land. He was somebody who had great power and influence over people's life. But he wasn't a believer in Jesus Christ. He wasn't someone who believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Lamb of God who came to this earth to take away the sins of the world. He didn't believe that. In fact, many of his friends would acknowledge that he was anti-Christian, like many of the anti-Christians we have living in our world today. We know there's a lot of people who don't believe the same things that we believe. We know that there's a lot of people who even speak out freely against Christianity. We know that there's a world that exists, a world of people, a a group of people that would deny that Christ is all of the things that we believe about Jesus. And this man, way back then, was one of those people. He didn't believe in Jesus. But one day... He became a believer in Jesus Christ. One day, this man's life was radically transformed by the power and the blood, by the grace and the mercy of God. He was saved by grace through his now faith in Jesus. And this man became a true believer. He understood the significance of Jesus being killed on a cross, being buried in a tomb, and being raised from the grave, this man was so convinced of the reality of the truth that Jesus now lives that he surrendered his life to traveling all over this world to tell about Jesus. This man's name was Saul of Tarsus. He later changed his name to Paul because he was a new man. You see, Jesus had come into his life and radically transformed his life, and Paul's life was no longer what it used to be. Paul was a man who wanted to destroy Christianity. He was a man who wanted to end Christianity. He was a man who wanted to persecute anyone who said they believed in Jesus. But this now changed man wanted to go out and preach the name of Jesus that others would discover the hope that we know we have in Christ Jesus. Amen? He wanted to preach him, and he preached him indeed because Jesus had radically transformed his life. He was a new man. And so I say all that to say this, that what you believe about Jesus, it matters. It matters. It matters. You see, when you know the resurrected Savior, like the Apostle Paul knew the resurrected Savior, it changes everything about your life. It changes everything about your life. And so this morning as we dive into this passage, and we look at this, I challenge you to think about what you believe. About you, what you believe about Jesus, about what you believe, about the resurrection, the very thing that we have gathered here to celebrate. Matthew 28, it opens up with a beautiful sunrise story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
In fact, the Scriptures tell us that it was dawn. It was that time of the day where the, the sun is beginning to break and it's beginning to turn darkness into light. It's that time of the day where the sun is beginning to rise. This morning, the worship team and, and I, we got here very early, and many of our other staff were here, and many of our volunteers, we got here before the sun was really even up, but, but as I was riding in this morning, I, I, I looked to the east, and I noticed that the, there was just a glint of pink in the air. The sun was, was beginning to rise, it was beginning to come, and just seeing that bit of pink in the sky, it reminded me of the very reason why we are here today. That today's a new day. Today's a new day. In fact, Easter, it, it is derived from a, from a word that, that, that tends to, to illustrate the need to look to the east, which is where the sun comes up. Easter, to look to the east and to remember that today is a new day. And you see, for the, for the two ladies that approached the tomb after three days it was a new day but you see they didn't live their life like it was a new day they were still grieving they were still mourning they had failed to remember what Jesus had taught them destroy this temple in three days I'll build it again they failed to remember the, the words that Jesus had taught. And so as they approached the tomb, they approached it like so many people live their lives today without a sense of hope. Where today is really no different of a day than it was yesterday. And yesterday was such a bad day. And I don't know that today is going to be any different. My life is full of despair. My life is full of hurt. My life is full of pain. And I'm not too happy about my life. And so today doesn't feel like a new day. This was the way that these two ladies approached the tomb. And see, they were on task. They were going to prepare the body. They were just hoping to get in. And as they approached the tomb... We see the story unfold, and right here in the middle of the text, we see that the angel of the Lord was waiting on them because he had something to tell them. There he was, having moved the stone, and sitting there upon it. It says in verse 5, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. You see, even the angel of the Lord is acknowledging that they come not looking for a risen Savior, but one who is a dead man. He says, you have come seeking Jesus who was crucified. You have come seeking Jesus who was, who was buried in this tomb. And so he acknowledges that their heart is really not in the right place. He, 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 he hasn't yet reminded them that today is a beautiful day. Today is a day of celebration. He just acknowledges how they are living their life, and they are not living their life as though Jesus has risen from anything, but rather that he is still in there. And so as they approach the tomb, he tells them, he says, I know what you're looking for. You're looking for something that's not in here. You're looking for something that that was promised not to be in here. You're looking for the body of Christ instead of the living Savior that you need to be looking for. And so he says to them, he says, I know what you're seeking. You're seeking Jesus crucified. But notice what the women, how they respond after the angel tells them the rest of the story. He says, I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. But verse 6 he is not here. He is risen. Amen? Amen? He is risen. Jesus is not in this tomb. Jesus is not in this tomb. You're not going to find his body here. Jesus is risen. He is alive. And he invites them. He says, come and see the place where Jesus was where he once lay 
You see, I love this because the empty grave represents hope. You see, if Jesus' body was in there, really their lives from this point on, everything that they thought they knew about Jesus would not have been true if the body was still in there, but the empty tomb was there waiting for them to come in and see. And as they walk into an empty tomb, they have now hope because they can remember the words that Jesus had taught that in three days I'll be up out of here. And indeed, he was. Amen? He was out of there. And so it represents hope, but it doesn't represent hope for just two ladies. It represents hope for every one of us in this world today. That's what the empty tomb means for us. It it gives us a sense of hope. It says that there is no longer a dead man in a tomb, but instead a risen Savior. And so the words of this angel were not just significant to them. They were significant to all of us you see on the cross Jesus paid the price for sin Jesus paid the price that you and I owed you see the Bible is very clear that the wages of sin is death what we what we are owed is death but it was Jesus who died on the cross in our place and so he paid the price that was owed on the cross sin became powerless over us Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Our sin was the sin that was nailed to the cross. Not Jesus' sin. And it was on that cross that Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. You see, what we deserve is wrath. What we deserve is eternal separation from God. But what Jesus did is he literally holds back the wrath of God that the wrath of God would be not something that we experience when we indeed are saved by his grace through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what the cross did for us. But can I tell you this morning, the cross is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. In fact, the cross is really just the beginning of the story or at least of the rest of the story, because what we have after the cross is what we celebrate today, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says here in verse 6. It says, He is not here, for He is risen. As He said, come and see the place where He lay. And then in verse 7, Then go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead. You see, the resurrection is the triumphal and glorious victory for every one of us as believers and followers of Christ Jesus. Amen? It's our victory. It's because of the resurrection, not the works on the cross. It's because of the resurrection that we can declare that we have life and have it abundantly in Christ Jesus. It is because of His resurrection that one day we can face the resurrection into His glory, that we can stand in the presence of God blameless and without sin because He covered it. This is what Jesus has done for us. The resurrection witnesses to the power of God himself. To believe in the resurrection is to believe in God himself. You know, if you're here today and you believe that God exists, and I do, I hope that you do as well. If you believe that God exists, and if you believe that God created the heavens and the earth, and I do, and I hope you do too, That if you believe that He exists and He created the heavens and the earth, that He created the universe, that He created everything that we know, if you believe that, then why would you have a problem believing that God Himself has the power over life and death? You see, the resurrection, bringing Jesus from the dead to life, is the the pure illustration of, of God himself he gives testimony that he has absolute sovereignty over life and death it's so important to understand what the resurrection is all about and it's even more important to believe in it to believe in the power that Jesus had 
over death. That we ourselves can have life because he lives. It is so important for us to understand that. I mentioned the Apostle Paul, a man who wasn't a believer, but was transformed by the power and grace of God and became a believer. And one of the things that was so remarkable about the Apostle Paul is how once Jesus transformed his life, he went out all over the world proclaiming the glory of God. Amen. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preached that our salvation is found in him and him alone. He preached it. And it didn't matter if people wanted to kill him, if they had stoned him and left him for dead. It didn't matter if he was persecuted. He didn't matter if he was shipwrecked. It didn't matter what was going on in his life. He refused to stop preaching about the Word of God. And here's why. Because God had radically transformed his life. He was a man whose conviction said, I believe in the truth of Jesus now as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I believe that Jesus is the hope for all mankind. And so I will go out and preach the good news of Christ. I will preach the gospel till every person has heard or until I die otherwise. I will go out and I will tell the world about Jesus. I will tell them because I believe in who he is. I believe in what he has done in my life. And I will do this for Jesus. One of the things that Paul also did was he wrote many letters. We know them as his epistles to the different churches. Some he planted. Some just went out by by others who went out missionaries and planted churches all around. But Paul would write to these churches, which we know to be great books of the Bible, like the Philippians, the Ephesians, the Romans, the Corinthians. And in one of the moments that he was writing to the Corinthians, he, he was writing to them, and he, he wanted them to know that which was so important for them to understand, that which was so important for them to embrace, that which was so important for them to hang on to. And so in his writings, he said these words. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. I love how he starts that little passage out of first importance. He says, what I'm about to tell you is of great importance. It matters in your life what you believe about this. He says, it is so significant that you don't want to miss what I'm about to tell you. And so he says, I write to you and I give to you that of first importance, what I also received, that Christ, he died for you. You see, Christ didn't die for himself and his own sin. Christ died for our sin. And so he wants the Corinthians to know that Jesus, when he went to the cross, he went to the cross for you. It was your sin that he died for. Christ died for you in accordance to the Scriptures. You see, the Scriptures long ago, long before Jesus even came to this earth, had spoke of a day when He would arrive. And it would be the Son of God who came and walked and lived on this earth without sin that He would be worthy of going to the cross to die for you according to the Scriptures. Verse 4, that He was buried. You see, He was a dead man. That He was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance to Scripture. All of this had been spoken of, but in accordance to Scripture, Jesus was raised in the third day. And he appeared to Cephas, who was Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. There's a stack of witnesses right there, isn't it? There's a pile of people who saw the the miracle of the resurrection, who witnessed firsthand the living God, 500 brothers who saw him at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Well, they're not alive today, right? I mean, but they were when he wrote it. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me. The Apostle Paul 
as he's writing this letter, he says, you know what, Ivan, Ivan came to know him myself. He's offering a testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what's important in your life. This is what I saw. And I want to share with you what I too saw. Jesus is alive. He's alive. Easter is one of the greatest times of the year because we celebrate this great truth. And what any true believer, anyone who's truly been saved by Jesus truly believes is that they believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe He is risen. You cannot believe in Christ and not believe in the resurrection or you don't believe in the Christ that can save you. And what a great truth it is to celebrate every year. The resurrection of Jesus, foundational to our faith. And so I hope you see today as we've walked through this text, I hope that you see today that what you believe about Jesus and His resurrection, it really does matter. It matters. And what you believe about Jesus and His resurrection will be revealed in how you choose to live your life. You see, Christianity is not just about Easter. It's about every day of our life. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And what a beautiful thing that is. Amen. Scripture tells us this, and I'll close with this. Scripture tells us this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved that is a promise amen that is a promise from God that if you confess with your mouth confess your sin and believe in your heart what that God raised him from the dead you cannot leave that out that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead here's the promise hang on to it you will be saved he says, from with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one is confessed and is saved. What a beautiful, beautiful story. Amen? Amen. To celebrate on Easter morning. Still not the end of the story, though. You didn't think I was going to leave a few verses off, did you? Here's how the story ends. I love this. So Mary and Martha, you know, they go in, they're invited to see the empty tomb, and they, they go inside the tomb, and they see that it's empty indeed. And the, the Scriptures tell us that they leave the tomb a little bit on the afraid side. They fear a little bit, but they're filled with great joy. I can only imagine that they begin to remember the words of Jesus that He had taught them before he went to the cross. I can only imagine that all of it began to make sense as they walked in and saw the empty tomb. But the story goes that these two ladies, they ran out of the tomb and they ran with great joy. They were doing what they had been told to go and find the disciples. And as they left the tomb, they didn't go very far before they ran into whom but Jesus. They ran into Jesus. And they get to see for themselves the resurrected Savior as He stands there before them. The Scripture tells us that He said to them, greetings. I don't know, I'd just probably fall over if I... <laughs> greetings. It's like, hello, you know. What a, what a greeting, right? Greetings. But I love the reaction of the two ladies. The Scriptures tell us that they, they fell at His feet and they worshiped. There's no doubt in my mind what they believed about Jesus. Is there in yours? They believed. They believed in the resurrection of Christ. They saw Him with their own eyes. They approached their Savior. They fell at His feet. And they began to worship Jesus. That should be the response of every 
believer as we think about who Jesus is every single day of our life. You see, worship isn't just coming in here and singing songs. As good as that time may be. And as, as worshipful as that is, that's not what the extent of worship is. Worship is how we live our lives every single day and how we respond to Jesus by what we believe about Him. Offering to Him the honor and the glory every second of our lives as we contemplate the goodness of Christ in our life, as we contemplate what Jesus has done for us, that's worship. And they worshiped Jesus. And then Jesus tells them something that's very interesting to me. It's something that I think is very important. As he looks at these two ladies who worship him, he, he looks at them and he says, Go and do not be afraid. That's interesting to me because so often we live our lives in fear, don't we? We know that even as they left the tomb, there was a little bit of fear that was still there. And, and so as Jesus is giving them some final instructions, he says, do not be afraid. And I think about this. I think about the fact that Anyone living the life of a transformed life, a life that has been radically changed by Jesus, there's no reason to fear. Fear the world? Not on your life. Fear the circumstances that we're unaware of? Why bother? Because when we have Jesus on our side and He has been raised from the dead, here's what we already know. He wins. He wins. And we're a part of that great story. We're a part of that great story. He has won. There's no need to fear. And then he closes with these words, Now go and tell. And I think about this. As a believer in Jesus Christ, there should be nothing holding us back from shouting from the rooftops what Jesus has done for us. Amen? If He has truly saved us from our sin, if He has called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light, if He has freed us from the bondage of sin itself, then why not shout from the rooftops the glory of God so that others who are living those lives of hopelessness can find their hope in Jesus too. Amen? Amen. we got two more songs to sing. We usually have one, but we want to invite you to remain seated and just think about the first song. The first song is from the perspective of Jesus speaking to those who he has saved. It's from the perspective of Jesus offering to us a great commission. As Jesus talks about the things that we know about him and what he has done for us, he challenges us to go and tell. So I want you to just worship as you listen to the words. And then we'll stand and we'll celebrate the goodness. We'll thank God for all that he's done together. If during any of this time you want to come to this altar and pray, that's okay. If that seems like a better act of worship for you, then you come to this altar freely. And you worship God through your prayers. If you want to come and speak to one of our pastors, they'll be down front as well. They'll be over here on the sides. I'll be on the front row. If you want to come and speak to me, we'd love to share with you how you can become a follower of Christ Jesus if that's what you want to do. Like those that were on the video earlier in the service who gave their life to Christ and then surrendered in obedience to baptism, who declared to their church family, I want to be a follower of Jesus. However you feel led to respond, you have the freedom to do that. So let me pray for us.